of fed up with the city and I took a drive and I ended up in Flesherton and, and something about it uh, really appealed to me. There was a nice feel about the town. The benefits for moving out here, one of the things that's happened is that I've become in touch with a number of small sawmills in the area. Uh, and from these, you know, the places that you wouldn't really know about if you're living in the city and you find out through word of mouth and, uh, or somebody finds out that you're a violin maker and they'll phone and say, listen, we got this log through and it looks great. You can go and take a look at it. So through that process, I've actually, you know, accumulated a certain store of wood and some of it's an excellent quality wood. I find that when I'm in Flesherton, I become a hermit. I don't really want to see people. I usually don't answer my phone and, uh, it's my escape from things. It's an escape to, to a peace of mind. And uh, when you're trying to paint a painting or make music or whatever it is that, that you do, you really have to have a, at least I have to have a clean slate in, in my own mind so that I can be responding to what's around me. You don't have to go far. I go sketching just a block away either, right? That's the main thing. In a way, I might have preferred further north, except for the fact that it's so far from Toronto. It's not exactly wilderness, but it's nice and farmland and patches of forest. We wanted to leave the city. We knew that. We knew we wanted to get country. Up to that point, we didn't even know Flesherton existed. It was just, it was here. And it, uh, it found us. Flesherton found us. Some people have no expectation of what they're going to see when they come in here, because this is very much um, downtown art in a small town environment. And that, you know, some people are definitely thrown. They come in and they, they're not sure what they're seeing. Um, and other people are, are just, they're overwhelmed. They're, uh, they, some of these artists are internationally famous. They've seen their work in Yorkville galleries. And they go, wow, you've got, you know, and they'll name off, you know, Harold Klunder, Roger Tomaszewski, or people who, who they already know the careers of, but they would not necessarily expect to see in this kind of environment. I've had people come in and look around and say, wow, it's a real art gallery. They go, yes, and we're from here. You know, this is, this is, you know, local talent. And I think that's pretty special for us, an area like this. I think uh, what would make Flesherton unique and, and special is that it's sort of going through a uh, rebirth period. I think there's a whole different awareness uh, happening there. Um, and I have to contribute it to the artists who moved up into this area. This studio was built to, um, to continue the idea of original printmaking and original thought that deals with this, the smells and the odor and the sounds and the feeling of printmaking only. We have done a lot of uh, experimental artwork up here. A lot of this work has been uh, exhibited through Canada, and we're, we just want to, like, you know, work with people. We kind of feel that there's good creative energy. We don't want to get involved in any commercial work. Being a printmaker, uh, first of all, it's a misunderstood art form because of the commercial interpretations of printmaking. There are these people who do reproductions, and that confuses uh, what a printmaker really is. I don't even know why people call uh, uh, this particular medium printmaking. I mean, it's, it's an art form like, like drawing, painting, or sculpture. Lithography is the use of a stone, hence litho, and of course the graphic means printing, so you're printing off a stone. Primarily you're using grease-based pencils and pastes and uh, similar to water color or gouache, and everything is done in black, so the artist he has to think in advance to foresee any color work. So wherever you drew, the stone wants grease. The water repels the ink, which is grease, in the areas you did not draw, but the areas you drew, it faithfully picks up the ink. When the ink is rolled onto the stone to the proper amount, you uh, put a piece of paper down on the stone, and you have pressure that goes on top of the paper, and it pulls the ink off of the stone onto the paper. Uh, hence, you get a print. The last 
landscape is an inspiration. Sometimes I could come out here with my canvas and sit in the garden, but that's not the way I work, because you can get mosquitoes and all that stuff in it. <laughs> you tend to make a mess and you with your paints after a while. I'll come out here, and people might think she's a lazy bum. <laughs> she's not doing nothing. Look at her sitting in her yard all day, not even working, not doing anything. I may come out and sit in the garden chair, and I'll relax and close my eyes and feel the warmth of the sun. I close my eyes because I can hear the insects buzzing. And then I'll open my eyes just a little bit and I'll see just a hazy view of the flowers around and, and the grass and that almost totally entranced with it all. Then I go into my studio. I take all that into my studio and, and I can go for hours nonstop, all night long, nonstop painting what I felt in that garden. The feeling of space around me makes me feel like I want to paint larger than I used to paint. I fell in love with the Saugeen River, and that uh, was a preoccupation and a romance of mine for, uh, for a good 25 years. I fly fish, which is a hobby of mine. I love the aesthetic quality of fly fishing and its relaxing properties. And the, again, the river sort of enticed that. The river um, is sort of a symbol for me that represents a, a lot of things. Um, I have a lot of uh, interesting ideas about the, the river. Um, I think it probably attracts um, females more than it does males, you know, because of the symbolism. Maybe the river, this particular river, is like an umbilical cord that kind of <laughs> any woman can attach itself to and have birth, you know, in, in meaning, you know, through through landscape and trees, and uh, and it it just nur nurtures that feminine interpretation of of art. I think. The ongoing theme in all of my work is the feminine archetype. I'm trying to reveal what the feminine is, what it has been, what it can be. Uh, my earliest paintings dealt with goddesses and then moved into pornography, then they moved into madonnas and virgins and through devils and demons and the Persephone myth through contemporary media being the new godhead. And the way the, the pictures are structured, I hope that it's closer to the way the mind really perceives reality to be. So that's why that there's a layering of imagery from different sources. I did nothing but paint skies for four years. When I started painting the sky, I was frightened because I thought that if I painted the sky, people would think that I lost my mind, that I was re regressing into the past, into the group of seven and so on. And it, so in a strange way, even though the sky paintings are probably um, my most conservative paintings, for me, they were very, it was very daring to do um, because I'd always been known for paintings of, of urban settings, bars, nightclubs and uh, street life to suddenly be painting clouds was, was really seemed out of character, I think. Living in Flesherton has allowed me the freedom to not worry so much about whether or not my work is addressing current aesthetic issues. And not that I want to necessarily be completely apart from my contemporaries, but I want to know that I am exploring something, that I'm not echoing something that's already going on. That's really important to me. It's like another small community has formed within, within the, the community of flesh in itself. You know, it's another sort of a, and it's a special community. And we inspire each other. I think we look at each other's work and I like to think we can say, I like that or I don't like that even, but those terms like jealousy and competitiveness and all that, it doesn't exist. I never expected to be living up here because I, I love um, the urban life. I was very involved in the 80s on Queen Street and uh, the thought of moving to a little village um, like Flesherton was, was really scary to me. I thought I would drop off the face, face of the earth, but 
um, the, the, only, the only thing that convinced me to move here was that there were other artists living here, f friends of mine, um, such as Lorne Wagman. Lorne Wagman and I went to the New School of Art in Toronto in 1975 and 76, I believe. And I think Lorne is my little kid art brother. I was always a landscape painter, even in Toronto, and I always searched out uh, whatever untouched nature I could find. Well, usually when I go sketching, it's a couple of hours, maybe three hours at the most. Uh, sometimes I'm looking for small weeds surrounded by soil. You don't want a big jungle. <laughs> and other times I'm, I'm painting deep forest paintings. My major color scheme, you know, everyone would notice in a minute, is green. <laughs> Can't get away from green when you're painting nature. Um, but uh, green usually leads to having a, um, complementary colors like orange and red. Uh, if just plain green plants and black earth would be boring, so you have to kind of search for, for colors that are just barely showing in nature and exaggerate them. So you end up seeing a lot of purple and orange surrounded by green. A good portion of artists are city people, really. They're, they deal with ideas, they deal with people. But there's a certain point you don't need that much input. <laughs> a very small amount of input is all you need to inspire years of work, usually. There really does seem to be a lot of interest in flesh, in it, and, and sometimes I find it puzzling because the, uh, the truth of living here is just that it's a community, and uh, um, for some reason there's a, a reputation of having a lot of artists and artisans, and I suppose proportionately maybe there are, but nevertheless it is a community, and I mean a week to week, let alone day to day, I don't see uh, anybody around. You know, if you were to take a guided tour of Flesherton and think you can see artists coming out of the cracks, it's not true. I mean, uh, people just just live here. Living in Flesherton is more positive than it is negative. And, and that, that, as for an artist, it's got to be one of the best places to live, I think. The community seems to accept eccentrics. <laughs> but I'm not a community type person. I'm not on the PTA. I don't go to town meetings or anything. <laughs> It seems natural that if artists aren't interested in art, who is? You know? So aside from being a painter, I'm also a collector. I collected lots by trading with other artists, uh, everybody else in town. I have some of theirs, and they have some of my painting. So this here is my first sculpture. Quite a few gemstones on this. As they went along, they, uh, they got more, uh, more plastic, less stone. This is the newest one I'm working on, just really started. It contains my second sculpture, which is really nice. And if it doesn't work out, it's a big waste, but it looks like it is. And let's see, show you around. This is the, my, the painting I'm working on now. Just started it yesterday. That's of the weeds in my backyard. That's the sketch. Over there is a Robert Barco print, one of my teachers. Ray Johnson, that landscape, and Shane West, all Fleshertonians. Uh, this is one of the Gershonisquitzes from the garbage. This is a, my most recent good find at a junk shop for $5. It's from the time of Rembrandt. That's a painter I never heard of. <laughs> and here are some more uh, living artists. That's Harold Clunder from down the street. That was a trade for Nisquitz. This is a Brian Burnett, a longtime friend from Toronto. Knew him from art school. These are a couple of my outdoor paintings from last year. One of a faint, that's the faint northern lights. That's uh, right in my backyard again. Uh, dandelions. Uh, here we've got a Derek Cairns. He may, mainly lives in Newfoundland, but he comes and goes from Toronto a lot. Uh, here's a more so drawing I got a little while ago. And so generally, everything gets plastered everywhere. I guess it's always been a dream of mine to kind of have a private museum <laughs> and or laboratory. <laughs> so that's what I've got here. And it's slowly... Uh, it slowly increases in quality over the air. Take down a bad painting and put up a good painting when you get them. 
Maybe some someday I'll donate them all to the ATO or something. You never know. Flesherton is not a hotbed for violin sales, so I'm shipping them off to sort of other more major centers or where there are schools. I'm in love with the tradition of violin making. I think people respect instruments if they're very visually appealing. When you're making an instrument, some of the important decisions that have to be made are made well before you even start. And one of those is sort of pattern and shape and the size of the instrument. And the other one is the material that you're going to use. And that becomes one of the ongoing problems of instrument making is where to get wood that you think is going to look good and be acoustically good as well. For me, one of the fascinating things about instruments is their variety and the subtle changes that you can make both for visual effect and for acoustical effect. Once you become involved in violin making, of course, you, you become victim of the whole mythology of, of violin making. Um, so when somebody finds out uh, you're a violin maker, they say things like Stradivarius, what was a secret? And of course, you don't know, otherwise you'd be, you'd be, um, you'd be a rich person. I think contemporary instruments and contemporary instrument makers are making very high level of instrument. You have to sell your instruments so visually and acoustically you have to uh, present something to people that, that they can use so that they will work in an orchestral or a quartet or whatever setting they choose and that people would like to look at and if you can do that there is a market for it i've never really had to go out and promote my paintings which is a weird thing i, I mean i know it's very weird but it just seems to happen if they can't pay me, then they'd bring me a loaf of bread, <laughs> you know, sort of a thing. But could I survive here in Flushing without ever leaving, leaving the village? Yes, I could do it. No, I still, uh, I'm not that self-sufficient. I wouldn't be able to sell enough paintings in Flushing to make a full-time living. You need Toronto, you need, you need those galleries. Here the beauty is sustained you know, through the environment. The environment is gentle enough to uh, allow people to live in. And also it, it nurtures people and it nurtures artists so that they can uh, work out ideas. My art, but the other thing is that my art has always revolved around some sort of uh, consciousness towards the environment. My, my whole aesthetic is based on that. So it's just a perfect area for me to be. And there are a lot of uh, environmental and social causes up here. So my art deals with that awareness the environmental, social aspects of, uh, of say, the mind. And, uh, and I, I don't know, maybe if I lived in downtown Toronto, I would uh, be doing the same art, but I doubt it. People that have moved here, artists, uh, craftspeople, uh, that are sort of drawing a certain kind of attention, really are just uh, people that have come into the environment with, with children, without children, with jobs, with problems, with sort of economic problems that everybody is having. In fact, in five years, I mean, all the artists, all the people that are working around here may lose their houses <laughs> and be out to the next place. I mean, uh, it, it could be an interesting commentary on, on uh, Canada in general, uh, what would happen to a small community like that that has, has sort of moved out and, and tried to keep going. People are basically self-employed when it comes right down to it. So uh, I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of the same problems that are sort of generally current in, in, in society at large happening here amongst, say, the artistic community. So it'll be interesting to see what's happened in, in four or five years with this uh, particular community. I think it's fairly rare to find such a variety of artists and musicians. And I think it's extremely rare to find artists 
all living in, in a close proximity like this with a sim similar spiritual bent. I think that the, the spirituality in, in uh, Flesherton is very unique. I think that everyone has moved here for reasons to do with um, self-exploration or self-affirmation of, of, some, of some kind. And because we're not, we're not all here because we all think alike. If, if you look at the, the different kinds of work and the different kinds of, and the different points of views that we all hold, um, you'll see that there isn't one idea holding us all together. But, and, and some of us, I think, are at the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of uh, philosophies. But I think we're all here because we want to become better human beings, whatever, whatever that means. Thank you.